Well, my dear friends, welcome this afternoon. What we're going to concentrate on this afternoon basically is focusing on Jesus as the Son of God, not God the Son. So we're not going to go into a lot of Trinity um, understanding, but we will be focusing a little bit on that at the start. So if you are an atheist, you don't believe in God at all. You don't believe that he exists. If you are a theist, believe in God. What we profess to be, what we are, is monotheists. We believe in one God. So that's what a monotheist is. Now, we are not alone in our understanding of that. There is many other uh, religions that follow the same pattern as that. Mormons, JWs, Christian Science, some Pentecostal churches all follow that line of monotheism. And also... Jewish and Middle Eastern religions also follow a monotheism um, way of understanding who God is. But the Jewish and Middle Eastern ones don't focus on Jesus at all, whereas some of the others, most of the others, all do. They're all Christian based or cross based. Today, we're going to mostly, as I said, we're mostly focused on Jesus, as we believe that he was promised by God was born into the world without any existence in a person prior to that. He led a sinless life. He died his death on the cross. He was resurrected, and it is only by him that we can obtain salvation. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation by any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So it's very basic and very easy to understand when you look at it in this particular way. So why have we chosen this statement? What is it all about? So the teaching that Jesus is equal or part of a Godhead is not part of Bible teaching at all. In fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite, and that's what we're going to go through uh, today. So where did this all come from? Well, First, what I could find, the first defence, and they call it a defence of the doctrine of the Trinity, was by Tertullian, who was born around 150 to 160 AD. Explicitly defined the Trinity as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and defends his theology against praxis, although he noted that the majority of the believers in his day found issue with his doctrine. So, this was, as far as we know, the first recording or understanding of where this came from. Now, all these characters, if you want to put them that way, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, are all mentioned in Scripture. They are a major part of Scripture, and they're all mentioned there. But they are rarely mentioned at all together. So... When did this become more official rather than someone's idea? We've all heard of uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325 stated uh, in the critical formula that the doctrine in its confession that the son is of the same substance as the father, even though it is said little about the Holy Spirit. So they bring Jesus in as a God or part of God without a real understanding of it. And there's hardly any mention of the Holy Spirit in this first instance of it. So around 175 years after it's first mentioned or any recording of it, and 325 years after Jesus, this is when it really starts to take hold. So what about today? So if you look up Doctrine of the Trinity today, it says the Doctrine of the Trinity is a Christian belief that there is one God who is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, other ways of referring to the Trinity as a triune Godhead or three in one. And this is accepted by about probably 80 to 90% of Christian faiths today. As we said, it has no support or no real foundation in Scripture at all. We believe that Scripture is the authority on everything. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit or by God's power. Go a bit later on. So, why this three? Why have they chosen these three out to 
Jews. So the Bible does mention God, it mentions his son Jesus, and it mentions the Holy Spirit. But when we look at these in a methodical way, they show very different roles that they played in in all of the dealings in, in Scripture. They have never, never mentioned as one in three at all. They never mentioned as three persons in one. Jesus said, when someone called him good teacher, Jesus replied, why do you call me good? There is none good but one that is God. Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 7. As we said, the concept of three and one is not there. The concept of the three together, probably the, the most notable mention of that is in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12 when Solomon says about a threefold cord being not quickly broken. And anyone who has anything to do with ropes or tying things down um, who deals with that sort of thing will understand you tie three together, it makes it very strong. But in this instance, there is no support of that as far as these characters are. Jesus said the exact opposite in that verse that's there. As we have said, each of these characters, God, his son, and the Holy Spirit, have specific mentions in the Bible, and they have very different roles. So speaking about God, this is what it says in Timothy, which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light where no man has seen, uh, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. This set God sets God apart as a creator and the sustainer of everything. And there is no other way to look at him because he is the only uncreated from him, everything proceeds. What about Jesus? Probably one of the better um, few verses on Jesus is taken from Hebrews chapter 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surety it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are tempted. Jesus was just like us, born human, and it is vital that he was born that way because if he isn't, then our salvation isn't real. He is a mediator. He is our connection to God. If we are human. God is divine. Jesus is the only one that can make that connection because now he is in the heavens and been given eternal life. Before that, he was human. So what about the Holy Spirit? Even back in the Council of Nicaea, not much was mentioned about this part of that they join in with the with the Trinity. It is simply God's power. And he can give it to anyone that he chooses. Luke chapter 11 and verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to good gift, give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? If you ask for God's power, it can be given to you. Acts chapter 2, and this is when the apostles received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost or, or Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they were given God's power on that time to spread the gospel. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 8, He therefore that despises, despises not man, 
but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. This was given for a specific reason. It was given so that the gospel could be spread after Jesus' resurrection. That's what it was mostly used for. There was other times that it was given, but the bulk use, if you like, of the Holy Spirit was to spread the gospel after Jesus' resurrection so that it could be taken through the world. As we said, our focus is on Jesus. If we take a little bit of a look, closer look at the verses that we read in Hebrews chapter 2, I've just highlighted or bolded some of those there. Shared in their humanity, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, and made atonement for the sins of the people. So atonement, when we say that word, it seems one of those complicated religious words that no one really understands what it means. But it's not that way at all. It simply means, if you look it up in the dictionary, to make amends. Make it so that something was wronged and something needs to be made amends from. That's a simple understanding of atonement. So let's say someone, a bank, a banker, lends someone some money. He says, here you go, you can have this money. And he gives it to a heap of people and they lose it. Bad investments, whatever. They lose all the money. They cannot possibly repay it. Now, the banker's got heaps of money. He doesn't need it back. He's got an abundance of money. But that put the people that took the money out of favour. He didn't want anything to do with it. But then one of them, a special one, manages to save enough money to pay back for everybody. All of a sudden, everyone's back in favour. That's what atonement is. That's what Jesus did. We sinned. We took ourselves away from God. Jesus is the way. And because he was human, it had to be, he had to be human for this to work because it's the only one. One of them had to stand up and say, I will not sin. I will do this. That's what Jesus did. That's why Jesus is special. Yes, son of God. But he's not divine in his nature. He couldn't be. Because he can't make that sacrifice and do that and please God in the way that he did, not be human. <coughs> That's what atonement means it's atoning for a debt. The nature of Jesus is critical to salvation. And this is what the gospel is about. This is the gospel in its simplest form. Jesus is the way, and the gospel is about uh, things concerning the kingdom of God and the way to get there through Jesus. So just like our banker, Jesus was the one that gave the money back, paid the debt. We are sinning and dying creatures and we are set apart from God. God did make a way for it to come back. That is kind of the difference here. God made the way open. He didn't have to do this, but he made a way for it to happen. We can't do this by ourselves. Jesus is the only way. His perfect life, his death and resurrection is the reason why we have this hope. Jesus, the Son of God. As we said, Jesus was like us. He was more. But he was unique in that he was God's own Son. From Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's the angel appearing to Mary. Or she was married to Joseph. She was still a virgin. Told that God was going to cause this to happen. 
Jesus was special, no doubt about it, but he was still like us. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 4, But when the time had fully come, God sent his own son, born of a woman, born under the law. There was still, and talking about the law, there was born under the law of sin, humanity, because that's what had happened way back in, in Adam. And that's what our reading this afternoon from Romans chapter 5 is all about. A death was in escape. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this is in this way, death came to all people because of all of sin. We're unable to escape that. That's a fact. That happened, and we see evidence of it every day. No getting around this at all. However, Jesus made a change to it. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man? So one had to overcome. It's like paying back that money. One of the people had to be the one to do it, pay back that money. God made a promise to man way back in the Garden of Eden and we believe that creation is a literal creation over seven days and God said, Adam and Eve in the garden, and he told them to use everything in the garden except for one tree. Don't go near that tree. Pretty simple instruction. Everything else, go for your life. The tree, leave it alone. But they couldn't. Tempted by the servant, Eve partook, gave to Adam, so did he. They'd fallen out of favour with God. Goes through with a whole list of punishments that happened and this is the one to the serpent and which represents sin. Genesis 3 and verse uh, 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life and I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So, as we said, the serpent represents sin. The offspring of the woman represents mankind, those who try to follow God. Striking of the head and the striking on the heel was Jesus because he led that sinless life. He was able to go beyond that sin and overcome it. And that gave the death blow to sin. So that was a striking on the head. He struck Jesus on the heel. Jesus still had to die because he was born just like you and me. He had to die because he was born with sinful nature. But God made that promise. And this is arguably the most important verse in the Bible because we had fallen out of favor as humans and gave a way for us to. While Jesus didn't exist before, in any way before his birth, he existed in the mind of God. This is where it started right here. There is all mentions through of him all through the Psalms, all through the Old Testament. And his life is summed up so well in one of the prophets in Isaiah chapter 53. Just picked a few verses out of that where it says he grew up before him like a tender shoot and a root out of dry ground. And when Jesus came, the word of God was very much um, in jeopardy of being lost almost. He had no beauty in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain. Certainly describes Jesus' time on, on earth in his, um, in his ministry of only three and a half short years. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was cr crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. 
by his wounds we are healed. So by Jesus' death, this is what gave us hope. He was like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. And if you read the records in the gospel, that's exactly what he did. He was accused, 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 and he said nothing to the amazement of um, of God. Jesus knew what his purpose was and he showed no, absolutely no resistance. God was showing us that he would fulfill his promise and yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. Promised him way back in Genesis and this is him prophesying uh, that he was the Lord's will to crush him. In the King James Version it says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him because it was going to fulfill the promises not that he liked, not that I'm sure God liked what he saw happening to his son, but he knew the outcome of it. And through um, the Lord, right? and though uh, the Lord made his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So Jesus would go beyond death and to resurrection, which we all know is exactly what happened. So, this is where our hope comes into. Look at some of the verses from the beginning of that Romans chapter 5, which we didn't read. It says, uh, you see, at, at just the right time, and we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good person some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If Jesus was not human, his death has doesn't have the same meaning, and consequently our hope doesn't have the same meaning. Since we have now being justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only so, but we also boast in God's in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now see, received reconciliation goes back to the debt to reconcile something. Anyone who knows anything about balancing books of business to reconcile something is to balance it out. That's what Jesus did. He balanced it out. Jesus paid the debt that it was absolutely impossible. There is, however, another part of this. Okay. We fell out of favour with God. Jesus provided the way back. Still need God's favour. Think back to our banker that lent all the money. He could take all the money back. He didn't have to bring everyone back in favour with him. If God did, why didn't he do it? Because God so loved the world. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, we're talking about Jesus, must be lifted up that everyone who believes on him may have eternal life in him. And another famous verse, if you like, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. As we said, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, man, Christ Jesus, First Timothy. We look at Jesus and think that he had was part of God or had divine nature in any way. The whole thread of the gospel begins to unravel and fall apart. 
So let's have a bit of a summarise of Jesus' work. He was promised at the times of man's sin way back uh, in the Garden of Eden. He was prophesied and mentioned throughout all the Old Testament and especially in the Psalms. He did no sin. Small little statement, but it's because of that that he dealt that death blow to sin. Sin is right now on its way out, and it's only a matter of time before that happens. He suffered on the cross, and he did that for us. Those that choose to look to him as those looked in the wilderness. Remember that story in, in the Israelites through the wilderness? They got bitten by the snake, they held the snake up. He looked at it. Well, has made it possible for us to reconcile to him. He has atoned or paid back uh, for our sins. What about us? So these last couple of slides, what I want to focus on is how we are connected to Jesus. It is only through us being connected to him. It's all very well that he did all this work and that he was born into the world, led a sinless life, dealt this death blow to sin. He had to do it for a reason. God loved the world and he gave his one and only son. So Jesus, we have to be connected to him. And if we jump one chapter over in Romans, it tells us how. Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, baptism doesn't do anything for us physically right now, but it does connect us to Jesus. It gives us that hope of the gospel. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has majesty or power over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, lives to death. If we believe that, and we believe all these things, then this is the promise God makes to us. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, Jesus Christ. And that's really the sum up of what the gospel and what the message of scripture is all about because the the wages of sin is death we know that that's proved every day in the world we live in the gift of god and it is a gift god chooses to offer that gift to us is eternal life by one action action to him and jesus